see that this project, not just the one that Munir is, is had here, but the one that Sergio started one year ago at least when you had the first meeting in Uruguay. Uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, I have a chance now to talk a little bit more about electrostatic interactions, but from another perspective. So if this works, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll try to divide my talk in a few blocks. First of all, I will introduce very briefly what we do in our lab. I mean, I know that lots of people uh, know what I'm doing because we, we have been in touch with each other for many, many years. Uh, but there are also new people, so I'd like to show a few things. Uh, the next block is going to be about pH, although this seems to be a very obvious thing, particularly in biochemical systems. Uh, there are lots of peculiarities in these systems, in particular when we are dealing with electrostatic interactions. Uh, new kind of mesoscopic attraction can happen, and this seems to be very important and most of the time neglected, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. And then with this motivation, we develop the coarse grain models to work with protein, polyelectrolyte, and now we are moving to RNA and DNA. So this is going to be the third block. And to finalize, uh, I'm going to give an example, and I took the case for spider rings. And the motivation for spider rings is because I could see on the program that people were working also with biomaterials. And this is a very good example of what, how we can combine the two words, I mean, the biological word with the material side. Sorry, the material science word. So this is going to be uh, my example uh, where you can see that there is a pH effect. You have a system that is controlled by pH and how you can set up uh, different experimental systems that could be used to develop and improve these materials. So let's go further. I mean, I'm coming, of course, maybe I don't need even to, to show this, but I'm coming from the neighborhood. I mean, Ribeirão Preto is very close to Campinas. It's about less than three hours time of driving. And in our lab, I mean, the main focus, the main research lines are to understand these fundamental interactions in protein systems. Well, uh, it could be an interaction between a metal ion, like a calcium binding proteins, could it be nanoparticles, could it be polyelectrolytes, protein, protein, and now, as I said, we are introducing this RNA in the picture. And the reasons for uh, to go to the RNA is going to be clear when I discuss more the pH effect. But what we have in mind, I mean, would you like to understand how pH, salt, and even mutations in these objects, they can affect the complexation, and despite their different applications, their different motivations, uh, what kind of common physics they have. So the first point is to understand physics. Of course, as a side effect, we also provide understanding for different processes, uh, and we can guide even applications for industrial things, particularly for proteins. Uh, if you think about milk proteins, there is a huge number of applications in the food and pharma industries, and this is something very useful. Uh, everything that we learn here, we try to put on a large scale, so we try to go to this bioinformatic approach. I mean, we're running very small projects in this field. I mean, of course, everything depends on the students, and it's, had, uh, it's very difficult. You can see that I have just a few of them. Uh, and, but I mean, the, the motivation here is to try to get our understanding and export this and provide service to the whole community for free. So one that's already uh, an alpha version, very preliminary status is Prometheus, where we try to provide electrostatic properties for proteins and a few information for complexation. So this is what we do, and of course, the motivation is to try to apply and to guide, or, or at least rationalize more complex systems. The whole process is like this. Suppose that I take a microencapsulation. This is something that people use a lot on the pharma field. I mean, they have uh, a chemical that they need to protect, and they are going to protect this using a kind of a capsid for this, uh, for this chemical. So when we look into these things, we apply the trick of the, that's very common in the physics course, I mean, the so-called the spherical call approach. We first of all, we identify the key elements. For instance, we know that for most of the microencapsulations, people use the proteins and polyelectrolytes, like pectins. So we know that the main, I mean, if you'd like to understand the whole thing, we need to understand how these two objects they interact in the presence of salt, in the presence of pH, and then we design simplified, very simplified model that helps us to really rationalize what's going on. Of course, we lose details, we are only going to see some issues of the problem, but we try to pinpoint the main issues and with this try to understand. And if necessary, you can perform more complex or more sophisticated analysis or more sophisticated simulations. Typical measurements from our simulations are titration plots, free energy derivatives, 
You can also get VRA coefficients, we can get out like PKAs, and you can do any kind of analysis that's basically on the thermodynamics definitions. So using a thermodynamics uh, concept, you can play a lot with these systems. Uh, I mentioned the pH, and of course, pH seems to be trivial. So let's go back to the, the basics. I mean, of course, the basic things that we know about pH is that it can denaturate proteins. So we know that salt also plays a role here and temperature, but uh, what's really uh, our main focus is how pH can control the association of the proteins. For instance, this is one practical result that we can get out from our simulations, as I mentioned, for, for the foodie community. For instance, they use these whey proteins uh, for the soft drinks productions, they use these for milk powders, infant for formula, and many, many other applications. So they would like to know how much they can control pH and how much salt they can put in the system in order to prevent aggregation. So we can give this kind of estimation of the free energy as a function of the pH and you see in which pH you have the maximum complexation. So if they would like to get rid of this complexation, they should work in other regimes. Or another step now is uh, what kind of mutations you can make in the protein or how you can uh, split your protein to small peptides and have the same effects and reduce or change the mechanism or how much salt I should put in the system in order to reduce this complexation. This is just ordinary examples. I mean, we could go on with examples. Uh, I hope it just gives you an idea. But uh, on the top of these things, you also have something more complex. This is the peculiar effect that I mentioned before. So if you go back from this very beautiful paper from Kirkwood on the 50s, he together with Schumacher, uh, proved in uh, an analytical and is using statistical perturbation theory that you can have an attraction even if two objects they carry the same net charge. This seems to be very controversial, very paradox. I mean, how, how on earth, let's say, a negative protein and another negative protein can attract each other in a purely electrostatic interaction. I mean, this is what they show in their paper. Uh, when you, you go through the equations, you end up looking to something like this. You have a direct Coulomb contribution. So if they two of them are with the same net charge, it's going to be a repulsive contribution. But you always have a negative contribution here. So all the time, you have an attraction, even if they have the same net charge. Of course, the dependence, I mean, here you have R and here you have R squared. So it's a weaker compared to this one. But this is still something not neglectable. And depending how big is the charge of the other interacting object, this effect is going to be bigger. So the C here is the charge regulation parameter. Some people call this the protein capacitance. Uh, is a measurement of how the charge varies with the pH. It's an intrinsic property of your protein. Once you know your protein, you know this parameter. And it can also be obtained from experimental measurements. So if you have a protein with a high capacitance interacting with another protein that is highly charged, you can see that this number is going to be bigger and it can sometimes be bigger than the direct Coulomb interaction. So now I can go back to my first slide and tell you why RNA became an important object to us. S uh, since RNA and DNA are highly charged objects, all these kind of effects are going to be amplified in this system. So if you'd like to focus on the charge regulation problem, they are very, very, very nice system. Okay? But this also gives us practical information. I mean, if I know the properties of my system, if I know the charge capacitance, and I know the pH, I know the charge, I know all these description, descriptors, uh, we can even use in this kind of equation to predict which kind of the, uh, conditions you need to do one thing or another. Of course, we can refine this prediction using the simulations, but we already have some, some good guides. So this is, uh, I think, a clear example why pH is a kind of a very critical issue and they should uh, look more careful to it. Uh, we already started doing such things. I mean, we, we can, uh, I'm going to show you a few slides about this. One is this classical experimental paper uh, where they observe in the lab, I mean, you have the Kirkwood equation, the one that I showed in the paper, but you also have lots of experimental data that prove that this is true. For instance, this is a kind of a classical paper from the Dutch community where they see that this soluble complex, they really f uh, are observed uh, in the regime where both objects carry the same net charge. 
And the most interesting, I mean, this is done with monovalent salts. So people that are familiar with electrostatic interactions, they know that there is the so-called electrostatic coupling parameter. And when this number is bigger than one, which is not the case here, uh, you have the so-called ion-ion correlation that gives rise to an attraction. This is something else. What I'm talking here is about an attraction that happens closer to the isoelectric point, most of the case, and in the presence of the monovalent. So the coupling parameter here is closer to zero, or in fact it's zero if you are talking about the PI. So in this sense, it's something, it's a kind of, let's say, new mesoscopic interaction. Uh, not so new, but we're talking about the 50s. But anyway, it's still new. Most of people don't know about this. And it happens in a totally different regime than the so-called ion-ion correlation effects. We observed this, I mean, this is a recent work where uh, we took this peptide that has antibacterial properties and interact with vesicles in different conditions. You can see that in the experimental data, I mean, if you compare the salt effects here, the salt shifts, they have 1.3. Uh, if you use the simulation with a fixed charge, you are out of the game, and only when you introduce the charge regulation effect, you can come up with numbers closer to the experimental data. So this is a warning. Come on, in some systems, particularly depends on which salt condition you are working with, uh, you can end up into troubles if you don't have a constant pH simulation. So, I mean, after this brief explanation about pH, and I mentioned to you that I'd like to develop a course of models in this call, uh, call, a spherical call approach, uh, how is going to be the issues that we have to fill with you before we build up a model? Of course, the obvious ones is going to be to introduce salt and pH, as you can see here. Uh, we also assume that electrostatic interactions are going to be our main drive interactions. So this is going to be a key thing. Uh, if we'd like to compare it with a theory, like the ones that I showed about Kirchhoff, we needed to sample the system and get free energy as a function of the separation distance. Because our main point is going to understand the driving, the, the interaction that drives the process. So we need to know how they happen as a function of distance, which means that we need to sample more and have a, a good description of the free energy. At the same time, we don't like to pay a very a high CPU time. So there are some constraints here, and we needed to repeat the calculations in several conditions. Several pH, several salt conditions, repeat them to, 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 to check if they have a conversion or not, and so on. And again, we are in Brazil, you all know about the crisis, so this issue here became even more important, budget. So even if you can afford a few nice access to, to good computers, it's still an issue. I mean, you have to do many, many calculations. So we have, of course, to think uh, about all these constraints before we go to our models. And as I mentioned, I mean, one thing that we have to do is to, to do one structure in so many different conditions and process and get results and also uh, Combine it is in such a way that can give you some kind of understanding. And again, most of the time you also like to compare different structures because mutation is also something important, particularly <coughs> when we're going to suggest how to improve uh, the system that people are already using. So with all these things in mind, we develop this uh, kind of models. I mean, they are very primitive in the sense, I mean, even the name of the salt description is called the primitive model. Uh, we have the protein that can be either atomistic details or can be a mesoscopic description. We merge this in a spherical box, so this is a, a good thing for us. We can treat the electrostatic interactions without any approximation, because all the interactions are going to be explicitly taken into account. There is no need for a valve summation or anything like this. Another good point, since we can define uh, a radius for the cell, we already define a protein concentration. So protein concentration facts can also be taken into account. Uh, if you needed to simulate a polyelectrolyte, well, polyelectrolyte for us is going to be something very simple. We just connect bits with a harmonic spring. We set up the harmonic constant in such a way that gives you the proper separation just that you find in the real polyelectrolyte system. And so we have a polyelectrolyte model. Water is replaced by a continuum description. So we also simplify the CPU time. And as I said, pH is very important, so we needed to make a constant pH simulation. The way that we do so is to couple with the simulation box a proton box, and we have these equations in our Hamiltonian, in the sense that we check for the change 
in the electrostatic interactions, I mean the main Coulomb interactions, plus a chemical contribution that depends on the pKa of the isolated amino acids. And we take this then from experimental data available in the literature. Of course, cysteines that are involved in sulfur bridges are not going to be included. But we can remove one proton from here and try to put the solution, check in a Monte Carlo criterion if you can accept or not, and vice versa. The whole system is going to be neutral. So this is the, the kind of modeling that we can do with explicit contrarians. This is important if you know that your contrarians, they are divalent or trivalent contrarians, because we can also include here the ion-ion correlation facts. But if you don't need it to include the ion correlation faction, we have developed another kind of system that's even a, a further simplification that can reduce the CPU time in two orders of magnitudes. So it helps us to go further in the size of the system that can be simulated. And actually, this is the one that we have already been working. I'm not going to show the data yet because it's an ongoing work with one protein from the Zika virus, the NS1. As uh, Sergio mentioned us about the Zika. We already are also with one feet, at one foot there at least. But this uh, new titration scheme, what's the main difference between the other? Well, we get rid of the split ions and we introduce them as a kind of the bi approach. But at the first moment you can say, wow, but come on, you already have a coarse grain matter, you don't have water, so if the next step is going to take out even the protein. It's like when you go to drink a juice and ask you no orange, uh, no, no, no sugar, no ice, and even no orange. I mean, you don't have a juice. But okay, we still have the orange here. We still kept the protein uh, with a few simplifications. But the nice thing is, even doing all the simpli simplifications, we got very good agreement between the two models. So you can see that I'm comparing here the charge as a function of pH, the capacitance as a function of pH, and dipolar moments for, in this case, three proteins with a different is different shapes. Uh, to be honest, all the time that I see this slide, I don't know if the points are the split model or the lines are the split models, because they are most of the time on the top of each other for different salt uh, systems. And we don't have any dampness on the size of the system. I mean, I can put any salt concentration that I don't need to put more particles in my system because they are implicitly taken account by the kappa constants. The only place that we can see some discrepancy is when we look into dipolar moments, particular for objects that they lose a little bit the spherical shape. But again, it's, uh, to describe general effects, is it still good enough? Okay, we can compare the two models, but about, what about the comparison with experimental data? This is something really important, I mean, particular when you go to this level that would like to work uh, more close to applications, you needed to be able to reproduce the data. So we start to look into general properties like the general net charts. One thing that people do a lot is to compare the PI, and you can see for several milky proteins, uh, the number between parentheses here are the experimental data. They are rather scattered. I mean, they are scattered by different reasons. Uh, one is, of course, intrinsic to the experiments. The other reason is because you can have different genetic modifications of your proteins. This is one issue that when you are dealing with the simulation, we take the structure from the PDB, and usually even you have one from one genetic species, or you have a mixture of them, but you don't have like they have in experiments. That's another thing. And uh, sometimes the salt condition that they perform the experiment is not that clear, or is rather also uh, a mess. But you can have a feeling that our numbers are close enough, except for this case here, uh, and yeah, and this one here that have 0.2 of deviations, and we are talking about logarithm scale, so 0.2 is not really the one that we want, but in general, we, we are able to capture the things. Furthermore, we are able to describe this attraction on the wrong side of PI, as I mentioned before, this effect of the charge regulation. Here you have experimental data for protein nanoparticle interactions. They use this for a bioseparation, so it's already a process that they try to put on a large scale. If you have a big concentration of different proteins, how to se make a separation of these proteins using uh, a gold particle where you glue different chemical groups, you put in the solution, and with a magnetic field, you can remove these nanoparticles together with the proteins that were linked to this, uh, this nanoparticle. And in this experimental paper, they have used TTMEA as the chemical, and they can see the complexation of BSA albumin and beta lactalbumin, one way protein. And they observe that it happens in a PA where they have positive charge and the nanoparticle is also positively charged. 
So again, you have the same kind of system that I have a positive object interacting with a positive object. And doing our simulations, we can come up with a very similar numbers. Of course, if you compare the absolute numbers, it's not exactly the same, but again, it's not clear in this paper what kind of a protein concentration they use it. So we assume the minimum here. And if I increase the protein concentration, I can decrease these numbers and we are going to be closer to them. But then you are not playing really a fair game because you know how to force the results to be closer enough. Uh, another thing that we can do, and also to check the models, is the so-called PKA analysis. So PKA, uh, there are, of course, I don't mean that we, this is the only method to do, but I think our key difference here is that we have a fast scheme. That's the key point. So the question is, if you're using all these approximations in a fast scheme that let me to apply this in protein-protein studies, protein-RNA studies, and on large uh, scale of this analysis, uh, if you are <coughs> still good enough to reproduce reality. I mean, the net charge is one thing, but what about charge distribution? What about very peculiar and specific effects in the protein? So the PKA is going to help you uh, to discuss such things. And here I'm comparing for the proteins that are usually used to benchmark PKA algorithms. Experimental data for three proteins, you can see, they have the so-called GB approach, that essentially is a mean field approximation. And you have our optimal simulation from Jenny Shane. Uh, she's from Charles Brooks, and she, they are using split solvent simulations with split atoms using a very sophisticated analysis to calculate the pKa. And you can see that at the end of the day, we are more or less doing the same thing that they are doing, despite all the approximations. So this is a, a very good motivation for us, because we, we do all the, all the approximations, but we are still able to reproduce uh, uh, the, the results on the same level as they do. The, where we have the maximum deviation, I mean, this 2.6 is where I have highlighted here to you. And all the three approaches, they have the problem in the same position. We have been analyzing, I mean, which, in which or, uh, position of the protein structure we have a tendency to have more, let's say, errors. And it seems that because we have a rigid object, I mean, you have a protein as a rigid model, uh, the flexibility can play a small role. So if you can shift a little bit the position of the amino acids, we can improve the results. So this is uh, something going on. I mean, we are trying to explore, explore this in the sense that not I mean, to compete with the others uh, to have a better precision, but to have a better precision using still a fast approach. The point is to keep it as fast as possible. We have extended this to RNA now, so we can deal with RNA. And again, it's the same. I mean, I can compare the experimental with this mean field approach. Uh, this is the, the classical paper from Barry Honig on the 90s. I mean, remember that although for protein you have large data sets for PKA analysis, for acid nucleics you have a small number of data available. So it's a little bit more tricky. And also, the techniques that deal with these systems are not so popular as the ones that deal with uh, for the same system, for, for protein systems. Uh, but there is a very nice paper uh, from last December where they have tuned the GB, the, 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 sorry, not the GB, the, the Poisson Boltzmann here, to improve the results. You can see that they have decreased their maximum deviations. Their average number is 0.5, so it's better than the initial one. And the way that they do, do this is to set up the dialectic constants of the model, so there are technical details here, but I mean, they, they set up some parameters and they can improve uh, their results. But again, if you compare the very sophisticated simulation data with these ones, they are off, and we are doing more or less the same that these guys are doing. So even for RNA molecules, we are doing a very good job to describe in nature using a very fast approach. So all these things motivated us to go further and apply this, of course, to different interaction objects. Uh, the advantage of this scheme is that I don't need to even worry now about my simulation box. The simulation box is choosing by convincing in terms of the sampling, because since I don't have anything explicit except the object that's going to interact with each other, we don't need to worry about. But we try to keep this cylindric shape here so we can keep the two proteins, or like the protein and the RNA molecule, in a line like this. They are free to translate and they are free to rotate in any direction. And the criterion to accept a movement is based on a Monte Carlo sampling. <coughs> and we can do this for different, as I said, salt, pH, and so on, conditions. Uh, doing so, 
you're going to end up with systems that different physical interactions are going to be the most important ones. Uh, we have been seeing systems that the Coulomb interactions are really the main <coughs> important. Systems like the charge regulations are really, is really the main interaction. I showed you a few cases already. Uh, there are, of course, cases that van der Waals is the main interactions. There are cases that depend on the situation, the charge regulation and the dipole interactions. They compete with each other, they complete each other. But the case that I'm going to show, I mean, with this motivation to be the link with the biomaterials, is the one that multipolar interactions are the most important. So now I jump to the last block of my speech, where we go to spider rings. Spider rings are very nice. I mean, of course, depends where you find them. But it's a biocompatible material. It's really very strong. You, you, you can compete with steel. Uh, and I think the most important thing, particularly for medical and applications, is that it's controlled by pH. So the spider has developed a very nice system that when the proteins are inside this kind, let's say, of box inside of the spider, spider uh, they are isolated. They are in a monomeric uh, state. But when they start to spill this spidering, they receive protons. So they change the, it's the, the spider changes the pH in this kind of tube. And when they are outside, they link together and they form this very beautiful and strong material. So it's a totally process, I mean, it's, co it's totally controlled by pH. Of course, there are lots of experimental data. There are lots of experimental discussions. This is one of the, uh, probably one of the systems that's more popular. If you Google now, you can see that it's increased the number of uh, comments about this because people are really interested in this, uh, in the control of the system for magic applications. You can, you can make, let's say, if you have uh, uh, an operation and you need to attach to things, you have a material that when the infection goes over, it's going to split. You don't need it to do any, any other intervention to remove uh, the remaining parts of this material. So it's, it's really very nice. You can also use this for tens, tendons and so on. I mean, but how can we explain this? I mean, we are talking about self-association. So if it's self-association, they have the net charge. The first time that I, I, I come into this, the first paper about this, I thought, wow, now I have another system for charge regulation. This is the, it was more or less automatic. And in fact, it's not true. Uh, what we could observe is like, of course, it's tricked by, by pH, but it's not a charge regulation. It's just dipole interactions that happen. Here I have a cartoon. I mean, this is already on the market. You have this BioSteel. It's one product made from, from spider rings. Uh, spider wing is this long here. You have a big particle here, about 3,500 amino acids uh, of polyline or glycine, depends on the, the piece. You have uh, uh, any terminals and a C terminals. The C terminals they interact by hydrophobic interactions, so pH is not going to play an important role there. But the any terminals is controlled by pH. So we focused here, and that's what I showed here about the slides. Here are experimental data. So they know that at pH 7, they are a part of, of each other. This is what they do in the experiments. I mean, it's not in vivo, but it's in vitro. And they know at pH 6, they start to aggregate. That's what they know from the experimental data. And of course, if you look to the structure, there is a belief that there is a dipole interaction. But this so far was just a hypothesis. It was never proved before. So the first thing that we did was to check the pKa calculations. There is no experimental data, but there are lots of data from other simulations. So we took the best ones and make a comparison between our data. Uh, the numbers between parentheses are for the dimers, and the numbers here are for the monomeric states. So make a comparison between these other simulations where they have split atoms, blah, 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 blah. Uh, our average deviation is 0.4. So it's much better than the ones that I showed you before, particularly for these systems. Uh, for this system, we are doing much better than we did before for that set of the proteins used in the benchmark. So, okay, PKAs are okay. Let's try to see if you can reproduce it, first of all, the experimental behavior. We know that at pH 7, they should be a part of each other. We know that at pH 6, they should come closer to each other. They should form a complex. And at acid regimes, they should apart each other again. So there is just a pH window where you can find the self-aggregation. Uh, I'm using here dashed lines for the case where we see that they are apart from each other and solid lines when there is a complexation. Again, from pH 4 to pH 6, 
we observe that they are complexed, and when we go to the other streams, they are part of each other. So we could reproduce pKa, and now we can reproduce the pH effect in general. The next question is, okay, now we know that we can reproduce nature, but can we understand what's the main driving force? So we have done simulations where we switch on and switch off different interactions and measured again the free energy as a function of distance. And we can see that, in fact, the hypothesis of the dipole is the one that makes true, is really true. I mean, you can see that the main contribution for the complexation that can beat the, the charge charge repulsion is a dipole interaction. So dipoles are really important. Of course, they have a small help from the van der Waals and even the charge regulation. But the main contribution is a dipole interaction. So now we know that the driving forces is one, and we can go further and try to make mutations and see how we can improve this kind of complexation. This is the next step of the project. Uh, and if you look, I mean, to the high pots, you can see that just look at the structure and calculate the electrostatics, you can clearly see that there is a tendency for a dipole. So it makes sense. The other part, I mean, is now to test the stability and its work of mutation. So one thing that I can anticipate to you is this result, I mean, where we have uh, molecular dynamics with OPEP first field. Sorry, Sergio, it's another one, but it was a longer history. I mean, we knew each other before we met. Uh, and we are trying to check, uh, first of all, structures that are more stable, because since I have a rigid object, and if you take uh, the whole trajectory, you can probably cluster different structures and test these structures to improve the description. We can see that for one mutation, I mean this mutation here uh, at the 17 position of this glutamate S, you can see that it's rather unstable. It fluctuates a lot, the RMSD and other properties. But if instead of using the, the original YD structure, we make the mutation and do a simulation, or we take one point from this trajectory and you compare, uh, we can see here that particular to analyze kinetic properties, we can decrease this point and come up with a better result. So we know that for some mutations, it's going not to be that simple to just go there in our input files, delete one charge and repeat the calculations. We probably have to combine this in this multi approach with MED. Because you can see that if I just keep doing what we did so far for the wide type, we can end up, particularly for some properties as, as this connected association here, uh, we can end up into big difference. The, the blue ones here are the ter uh, experimental data, and the green ones are the ones that comes from the simulations. In order to reduce this one, I had to use the, one of the clustered structures from the immediate trajectory. So there are, of course, nice things of this approach, but there are, of course, limitations. And you can see that one is, is this, but we can uh, pass this problem, combine this with an uh, MED approach. I guess I can highlight now to, to finalize. I don't know how, but I guess my time is over. So uh, I hope I could show you that simplified models can help you to understand even complex system, molecular mechanisms, and so on. We can design new rational applications. I mean, if I can make a mutation and make a, a proper prediction, we can scan all the possibilities and indicate to the experimentalists where they should go. Uh, electrostatic selectivity is really something possible. I could show you the protein nanoparticles as an example, a very brief example uh, of you can even make a bioseparation process, just change the pH or the charge or the salt solution. And also that the charge fluctuation is really important. So this is a mechanism that should be uh, better evaluated in all the applications, particularly when we are close to PI and working with very little salt. Because this can play a role and it can change the picture from repulsion to attraction. There were lots of colleagues involved in this project, there are a few students. I mean, Ladian is the one that worked with the mil pro milky proteins. Colleagues like Luis Gustavo that was supposed to be here, according to Mauricio, and it might, is going to show up. Uh, João Rugiero is the experimentalist that worked with the, the peptides. Thaisa is his student. These are my colleagues for different projects. I mean, these are the ones that are behind the OPEP first field, and we are uh, doing uh, the RNA studies. Dono is the one that's working with me with the PKA improvements. And Mikael is the one that we worked together for, for the original titration scheme. Of course, you can never do anything without funding. I'm still hoping that Flapest can approve my next projects, 
but uh, I'm keeping their name here as a kind of a commercial that for them to don't forget about me. Uh, and, and so far we are getting more uh, support from international plays instead of FAPES, but never mind. And of course, we needed to thank the, the taxpayers that support all this kind of, of work. And I thank you for your attention. But before I finish, I hope uh, Mundir is not going to mind to make two announcements. If you like this kind of things, there's going to be two events. I mean, since this is a kind of uh, integration thing, I should mention this. We organize this second meeting now in August. Uh, it's more focused on protein fold and aggregation, particularly from uh, an industrial perspective. And we are going to have in Brazil next year uh, another more, let's say, electrostatic event here. So you and your students are very welcome. So these are the two events. And with that, I think I should finish. And thank you again.